Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We'll, we'll make a start now for the second part of the talk. I'm sure some more people will drift in as they finish up on their, 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 their coffee and the like. Uh, so th in this part of the talk, I want to just focus on the... Uh, uh, the F-Sharp has sort of developed a, a specialty, I think, in uh, uh, features which are heavily inspired by academic research or which are outright contributions as, as, as research papers but which also are carefully chosen to, be, to, be, to solve a set of industry critical problems and to sort of enhance the power of, 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 the, functional, of the core functional programming paradigm. And one way, one way I, I like to summarize this strand of work is, as F-Sharp as a, as a research project is to take a retrospective from 1998 through to today and think how programming has changed. Particularly, I mean, from F-sharp, particularly like from the F-sharp perspective, like what, I feel we've been able to completely <coughs> change the way that Microsoft approaches languages and software development. Now this is partly to do with .NET, the .NET framework, but partly to do with language work coming from Microsoft Research in, in Cambridge as well. And uh, so we have to take our mind back to 1998 and everything that was in vogue back in, in 1998. You can all kind of remember the various days of smoking ban in California, or the XML was all the rage, and object-oriented programming in Java was all, all the rage. Objects, objects, objects rule the world. Java, to me, was a great language. It was a great meme. It plugged into the meme of the internet very well. But somehow what I loved about programming was completely missing. And if we looked at Microsoft back then and Microsoft Research, Microsoft was touting things like the, digi the digital dashboard or something, which nobody ever quite knew what it was. And uh, that th was that the best we could do with regard to innovation? And on functional programming, it really was a bit of a ghetto. Uh, we would uh, experience if functional programming has been great when using systems like a camel, but we couldn't make them work in real. There's a great paper by Phil Wadler about no, why no one uses functional languages, about the isolationist nature of functional languages. And uh, that's from 1997. That was heavily influenced the design directions of, of F-sharp. And now if we roll forward and we think just about this, this part of the programming world, .NET, F-sharp, C-sharp, Visual Basic, um, and there's no... no res there's been great advances in lots of other practical programming languages in the theory of languages as well. But we see things like .NET generics uh, just completely changing the foundations on which we build object-oriented programming. And this had this, uh, that also enables F-sharp. Uh, it's built all the way through on .NET generics. Then we see things like C-sharp link, which is, uh, I mean, is, is still just an amazing achievement that we have a, a, a declarative query, language integrated query programming in a major industrial language. There'll be many other languages will be playing catch up with that uh, for a long time. We have things like the F-sharp metaprogramming. Meta we have units of measure in F-sharp. We have uh, the integration of task-based, silk-like task-based programming through .NET 4.0. We have the integration of asynchronous and parallel programming in F-sharp. We see that directly being taken by C-sharp and Visual Basic. So suddenly we're going from the, the position where generics took what? Generics took 30 years to get into practice from Clue through to, uh, to C-sharp. I mean, there's various manifestations along the way, but uh, I think we really sealed it in C-sharp. And uh, we're seeing a much faster turnaround. U units of measure took from 1994 for the core, the core work on the, the inference algorithm used by the F-sharp units of measure. It was 1994 to 97. And we turned that around in 10 years to be in, 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 a, in a professional programming language. 
and in the C sharp VB asynchronous parallel work, well, in some ways, that's a form of continuation based programming uh, or state machine based programming or coroutine programming, uh, which has been around for a long time. But the latest manifestation of that is uh, definitely now entering the, the mainstream family of, of languages. And along the way, I hope we've been able to do this with an eye on transferable research results that you see the publications in, in PLDI or, or the publication forms like the C-sharp specification and the standardization of those. Uh, or we see uh, publications around C-sharp link or about asynchronous and parallel programming uh, and, and uh, units of measure and so, and so on. So that these aren't just practical results but actually transferable research contributions that can be picked up by other languages as well. They're my favorite papers among all of those ones. So to me, uh, we have changed programming in practice and opened up a route between academia and industry. Uh, I think we've proven that there's a lot more to typed programming than the core Java model. Uh, when, when you think about all these different results, they would have all been incredibly controversial according to the object-oriented orthodoxy of the, the, the late 1990s. And we've, I think, really proven that the object-oriented orthodoxy is not the right way to tackle the problems of query-based programming, of, of strongly typed programming with generics, of asynchronous and parallel and agent-based programming, and that the core type systems can be augmented by refinements like units of measure. So there's much. We place Microsoft Research at the heart of language innovation at Microsoft and the industry more generally. And uh, functional programming is now viable and really just entirely a part of mainstream programming. Half of C sharp programmers would also consider themselves functional programmers, which gives you thousands and thousands and thousands of functional programmers in, uh, in, in, in w using functional programming all the time in the real world in their day to day work. Uh, and I think. We've gone beyond those core language issues to be talking about data access and parallel uh, programming and uh, in these language integrated queries and asynchronous programming. Okay, so we, let's talk about the F-sharp asynchronous programming model. I'm going to hand over to Thomas uh, to, to give his view of this, but if you want to know the paper to, to, to captures this model, it's a paper from Paddle 2011. If you just search for F, the title or the authors of Paddle 2011, you'll, you'll get it off, my, off, our, off our various papers. And just if you're interested in units of measure, this is the paper for that, uh, one of the many papers by Andrew Kennedy. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting theory about units of measure, about the inference algorithm that's used in F sharp, about the, uh, what it means for units to be to go wrong at runtime, uh, and uh, so this sort of a semantic, semantics view of, of units of measure. So over to Thomas for, to, to talk about asynchronous programming. I'll turn my mic off this time. <laughs> okay. Uh, does it work fine? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, uh, I won't have as much time as I expected, so I'll skip some of the, some of the topics. Uh, I'll start by, by introducing asynchronous programming in F-sharp. Uh, so I'll show you some of the basic uh, examples. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about some asynchronous programming patterns that people have been using in F-sharp that the F-sharp library, uh, library provides. Um, I'll say a few words about how, how F-sharp async relates to the recently announced uh, extension to C-sharp for asynchronous programming. And I'll talk very briefly about uh, my research extension of the programming model, which is not going to be in any version of F-sharp anytime soon, unless Don changes his mind. But um, it's available as a extension for the open source version of F-sharp. And I'll, um, it's, it's, uh, it extends the programming model in, I believe, quite interesting way. And it also demonstrates that you can use F-sharp to do research 
in functional programming languages. So the problem of asynchronous programming is really based on programming with callbacks. Uh, there are many operating system functions that uh, you can invoke uh, asynchronously, meaning that you give the function some, some callback. Um, for example, when reading contents of a file, you give the function some callback and the function will call the, uh, the operation will call your callback when it completes because the operation takes a long time to run. It may need to wait for the disk or it may need for, to wait for the network and it doesn't do anything in the meantime. So you want to avoid blocking the current thread that executes the operation at least on, on systems like .NET and JVM where threads are quite expensive. So it supports, it's the, the main purpose is to support IO bound operations in a real, reliable, scalable way where you can spawn thousands of tasks or some agents and they can all run in parallel without blocking the thread when they don't need to. Um, and it's it's quite serious and relevant industry problem. Yes. Uh, I'll I'll say a few things about that. Um, it's not based directly on the .NET Task TPL model uh, because it existed before the .NET TPL model, uh, and it's. Mainly, it's, it's also, uh, it also allows, allows us to do some things that aren't directly supported by the TPL model, but you could define an alternative implementation based on the TPL model. It wouldn't give you all the benefits that easily, mainly, may, maybe, but uh, I'll, I'll say a few things about the comparison because the C sharp version of this is using the .NET TPL model and uh, so I'll, I'll compare the two a little bit. So this is just a brief example of some explicit event-based uh, programming style um, where we are creating the callback explicitly. So we are, um, it's, it's something you could, you could write in F-sharp. Uh, so we are starting some HTTP server and uh, it, we specify a function that should be called whenever a request comes. When a request comes, we start some download um, from some proxy URL. And when the download completes, it would call our function. Uh, and we would, we would write the data that we received to the output, to the response stream. And it would give us some uh, we would specify a callback that should be called when the operation completes uh, and then close the stream. So this solves part of the problem. Um, it's concurrent programming model. We are not blocking the thread. Uh, and this, this programming style, I used it as an example because it's becoming quite popular. There's a library called Node.js, which implements essentially this in, in JavaScript. Uh, but the syntax isn't, you have to write the callbacks explicitly. So really, we would like to write something like this. We are just uh, doing three calls in, in sequence. Uh, we download some data, write the data to the output, close the output stream. Maybe in f -sharp we should really probably write something like this. We should make sure that the stream is closed even if some exception occurs. Uh, and writing this kind of things in the explicit, explicit programming model is really difficult. Uh, and using F-sharp asynchronous workflows, we can write it like this. So the, asy the thing is that we edit this async block, um, which wraps the whole code. And it essentially means that the, the inner code should be translated to some continuation passing style. Um, and we are using these bank operations to denote, to specify where the operation should be done asynchronously using callback. Um, and the, so the, the, the only language syntax extension is the async block and these two bank keywords. 
Otherwise, uh, on the inside, we can reuse use all the all the syntax or most of the syntax of F sharp, uh, like try finally, and it gets translated to some uh, operations that are provided by the async uh, async object. So the translated code, uh, how it, how it compiles, that looks roughly like this. So the bind operation. Uh, corresponds to the let bank keyword, where uh, we're um, taking the asynchronous operation and some continuation that should be called when the operation completes. Uh, nested binding uh, is translated to uh, nested nested uh, function calls. Uh, there are some additional operations like async dot zero, which is uh, operation that doesn't return anything. And there's also a try finally operation, which is something that the library provides. And it implements something like continuation based try finally, try finally construct. So this takes some asynchronous operation, these three lines, and a function that should be called uh, at the, in, the, in the finally block. And this operation takes care of making sure that when there's some failure in this block, it will call the, uh, it will catch the exception and run this. Or if there's no, no exception, it will run the fi finalization anyway. Yes? The async zero there, um, that's because I'm not returning any result from the function. So the function just does some imperative uh, reading and then imperative writing. Uh, if I wanted to return some result, I would, I would use return, for example, some number. Uh, and the zero creates some asynchronous operation that returns unit. So it's just, um, in this case, it, it means the same thing as return unit value. But in other computation types, it could mean different things. Yes? The question is whether the lead bank operator means anything outside of the async block. Um, no, the, the bank operators can live only inside, the, inside some blocks that provide the bind operation to specify the, the meaning of it. But it's, it, um, so the lead bank outside of async would probably mean the same thing as usual let uh, if you would interpret it as a, some identity monad or, or something like that. The, the reason why there's lead bank and let in the syntax is that you can also use uh, usual let keyword uh, to bind value to some expression that's not uh, asynchronous in this case, or that's not monadic in, in general case. So that's the, that's the translation. Uh, to say a few things about some, some asynchronous programming model that you can, uh, these, are, these are some patterns that you can implement using the basic asynchronous workflow machinery that F -sharp provides. Uh, so there are the first two are just uh, supported by some combinators in the library. To implement fork join parallelism, uh, you can use async.parallel, which takes a list of async operations and gives you an async operation that returns a list of all the results. Uh, and that can be used to spawn multiple parallel workflows and wait until all of them complete. Uh, to implement futures, uh, you can, you can you, there's, there's some operation that starts a workflow and gives you some token back, and then you can wait, uh, then you can do some other things on the main logical thread, and eventually at some point wait until the background operation completes. So that's all supported by the uh, F-sharp library. Uh, there's also a library for writing Erlang style agents, where, which also relies on the asynchronous programming model. 
So an agent is, is some object that executes some body, which is asynchronous workflow, and the body repeatedly waits for messages. When the agent receives a message, it can react in some way by sending some messages to other agents and so on. Uh, the, main, the main reason why this is built on top of f -sharp asynchronous workflows is that if we make the body asynchronous, we can wait for messages without blocking the current thread. So you can create thousands, tens of thousands of agents that all run on uh, a few threads in the, in the .NET thread pool. Or in the extreme case, it can all run on a, on a single thread, which is relevant for the, for the last async pattern. Um, if you are creating some user interface interaction code, uh, then typically the, the user interface doesn't do any heavy calculations. It just changes some, some label of a button or something like that. And uh, in many libraries, uh, definitely on .NET, and I think it, it applies to other frameworks as well, you can only access user interface elements from, from the main single thread. So in f -sharp, you can also use asynchronous workflows if you execute them in some special way uh, to write reactive applications that run on single thread and interleave steps of several asynchronous workflows when they are blocked by waiting for an event or something like that. So I'll uh, show you one example of using the reactive programming model. Um, in, in .NET in general, there's an interface called iObservable that represents events. Uh, and you can view that, you can view this as a, semantically as a list of time value pairs. So it's uh, some data, some structure that uh, represents events that can occur repeatedly, like mouse clicks. And when the event happens, uh, it gives you some value, like the x and y coordinates. And to access this, this data structure from the f -sharp asynchronous programming model, we can use evade observable, which takes the observable event representation, and it gives us asynchronous workflow that waits for the first uh, event, that for the first occurrence after the time when we call this, uh, call this operation. So it's not, it's not semantically pure. It has a side effect in the sense that it relies on the current time. Uh, and we can use this operation to write something like the code below. Hopefully you can. Uh, I'll move it like this. So this is an example uh, where we are creating asynchronous workflow that waits for the first occurrence of some click event. Uh, and it gives us coordinates of the, of the click uh, event occurrence. And we can call, we can use this, this operation repeatedly, uh, which is one interesting aspect of f -sharp. This creates just some function that we can start repeatedly and it will, it will execute the body multiple times. Uh, and we can call, we can use this function recursively to wait for the next event and so on. So the example I'll, I'll write that will hopefully give this some sense is a semaphore light, which is a fairly simple uh, idea. The idea is that we want to create some application where you will click on the, on the screen or on some button. And as you click, it will loop through all the semaphore states. Uh, and the usual imperative approach that people use, at least in, in C Sharp, Java, uh, is that because this is, this is reactive, you cannot really encode it in some natural way. So the way people would write it is to have some mutable state. Uh, and when you click, the handler would change the mutable state. Um, 
and modify the, the user interface. But in that, in that way, you don't really see what the transitions between the states are. So a better approach would be to write some loop that simply loops through all the states. Uh, and that can be done using the uh, asynchronous programming model in F Sharp. So this is a sample application which is uh, using Silverlight, which means that it runs inside a browser as a component, but that's really just the aspect of the sample. The main part is, is this, which uh, is some asynchronous computation that waits for mouse click, then displays the green light, then waits for the next mouse click, displays the orange light, and so on. So if I run the example, it starts with all the lights turned on. And if I click, it runs through the asynchronous workflow. And I just explicitly wrote waiting for three events. So I cannot wait for, um, I, if I click, it, the, the workflow ends after the three clicks. So uh, that's why it ended up with the red light. But I can use all the F sharp syntax inside the workflow. So if I change it by, uh, by adding while true, I will hopefully get a semaphore light which loops through all the, all the colors. So it's, it's really, the, the code I'm writing is more like long running asynchronous uh, operation that encodes some aspect of the interaction uh, it, it encodes some state machine that the user can, that the programmer can easily draw and understand. And I can make this code sample even nicer by using uh, a simple for loop that iterates over a list of states. So the same loop can be encoded like this by having a for loop that iterates over the three colors and wrap this inside a while loop that for the whole time the application is running, iterates, lets me do the, do the perform the interaction. So I think that's, that's quite elegant way people can use to express um, long running operations or interactions uh, with the user interface. Uh, this programming style has, I think, very imperative nature in the sense that you're waiting for events uh, and reacting by changing some, some uh, state in the application. Uh, it can be made nicer by writing some higher, higher level combinators over this, this programming style. Uh, but that's, that's another question. And I'll maybe start talking about the research extension that I work on. Yes? I have two questions that are related to what you're doing. So, in one example, you had return bang and then two numbers for the mouse click. And here you are not returning anything, you are probably returning this. Yes. So, in, in this case, I'm not returning anything because the, the loop is. Uh, it's infinite loop. Uh, I have while true. So the, the loop is, uh, is infinite, but it's asynchronous, so it doesn't block the application. It, yes, it, it runs in background forever, and it never returns anything.
I guess this is, this is valuable because you can separate concurrent programming from parallel programming, where concurrent means uh, just running multiple logical threads uh, using some interleaving or cooperative, cooperative multitasking. Uh, each time the, the application blocks in the lab bank asynchronous operation, the thread is, it just stores the operation on some stack or something, uh, and the thread is, the single thread of the, of the user interface is free to do other processing. There was some other question, yes? Yes, so the, the, I think you can compare this style with the declarative style that Don demonstrated when doing the Twitter example, where he used things like event.map, event.filter, and that's, that's more the declarative uh, FRP-like, functional reactive programming-like style of uh, describing the, the interaction. Uh, the reason why I think this is, this is useful is that expressing uh, arbitrary state machine in the using the combinator style is a bit difficult, or at least I haven't found a nice way to do it. And this this programming style allows you to draw the state machine on the paper and just directly encode that idea in your program. And the reason why I wanted to move to the research extension is that it was something that's motivated directly by the previous example. Um, if you're encoding a state machine, you can use lead bank to wait for one event, but very often you want to have a choice between two events, or you want to wait for some combination of events, or for an event that carries some particular value. Uh, and that's something you cannot quite directly express with the current language, current syntax of asynchronous workflows. So, and th there, are, there are quite a few other examples aside from event-based programming. Um, some tasks when programming with futures, like wait for both futures or wait for the first one that returns true or something like that. Or even a uh, programming model based on joint calculus. That's something that's very well known in theory. It works very well, but it's, it's difficult to implement that in, in practice. And uh, the extension I did for F Sharp as this match bank construct, which is uh, just like lead bank is a, is a general, is a asynchronous version of lead. Uh, this is asynchronous version of, um, of pattern matching. So the arguments here are some, some um, computations or some special values. In this example, they will be futures. And if you write this example, it will start the futures in, in parallel. And then when both of them complete, you will eventually run this, this block of code because um, the syntax we can use inside the patterns is either bank uh, and some pattern, which means wait for a value that matches this pattern, or uh, you can use you can use underscore, which means we don't really need the, the operation to complete. We don't care if it gives us a value or not. Uh, so in this example, um, this encodes waiting for two futures. Uh, with a special case when one of the futures returns zero, uh, because then we can return the result immediately without waiting for the other future. Uh, so the, this case is the general case that will be used when both futures complete and give us some value. Um, this case, these two cases are special cases when one of the one or the other future completes producing zero, uh, and the other we don't know yet if it if it completed or what value we got. Yes. Uh, 
uh, well, they, they are also prioritized by order. So if, uh, in this case, it, does, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but if you had two cases with uh, bank A, bank B, it would select the first one by, by definition. In this case, the only possible overlap is if the two futures completed at the same time, uh, which is uh, non-deterministic non -deterministic weighting, so that's a bit tricky question. Um, if we had deterministic programming model, they probably wouldn't be able to complete at the same time. Uh, so if, 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 it would, if it would be possible for both of them to complete at the same time and one returns zero, then it would still run the first clause because it checks the clauses in order. Yeah. So the way this example would run is that uh, when the match bank expression um, runs, it starts both computations. When one of them produces a value, it will check if it can run any of the clauses. Uh, if the value is zero, then it would immediately run the body and um, cancel the other future. And the same thing can be, can be used to encode a programming model based on joint calculus, where we are, the, the, in the previous case, the future produced only one value at, after some time. The joint case is it's quite different because we are matching on some channels that can have values repeatedly. And the idea is that if there's, uh, if there's some clause that can be executed using the values that are currently in the channel, then it will run the, run the clause. So if we have a combination of put int, which is this clause, and uh, print, print a message, then it will run the body. But if there are multiple values in the channel, they stay in the, in the channel. So um, I won't go into details. Uh, you can find more if you search for join ads. There's a, there's a pedal, pedal paper. Uh, and the idea is that we uh, try to find some abstract description uh, in terms of operations like bind uh, that you can use to match all these, all these different programming models together. So Don, do you want to go or should I say a few things about C Sharp? <clears throat> so the, uh, there are quite a few, few design choices that have to be made when, when designing this um, asynchronous programming model. Uh, I think there are two main differences between how this is done in F Sharp and how this will probably be done in the next version of C Sharp. Uh, the F Sharp language uses reusable syntax extension. So in, the, in some of the examples I was using, uh, I used some other block instead of async. I used future or join and gave different meaning to the special operations inside the, inside the block. Um, in the C Sharp proposal, they have just a particular syntax for asynchronous programming in the style of the async workflows in, in F Sharp. Uh, the benefit of the C Sharp approach is that they can easily uh, have more optimized compilation. Uh, they translate the, the, the code to some state machine, which requires less allocations than continuation-based uh, approach in F Sharp. On the other hand, in F Sharp, because it's in a library, it's much easier to uh, support more, fe more, fe more, more features. Uh, for example, F Sharp has implicit support for cancellation of asynchronous workflows, which isn't done in, in C Sharp, probably because they would have to implement it inside a compiler and not just as a, as a library feature. And also the, the reusable syntax is, it allows us to do many other things beyond just asynchronous programming which is, I think, very, very valuable. And 
The other difference is that there are quite a few ways of representing um, asynchronous operations. <clears throat> the, the categorization that people inside Microsoft use, uh, I'm not sure if it has any, any better names from research background, but uh, if you have cold task, uh, it means that the asynchronous workflow uh, creates some object, a task that can be started and will eventually give you a value um, either using some continuation or by blocking. The hot task programming will, that's, will be probably used in, in C Sharp, returns a task that's already running. So if you, if you write async something something, then it creates a task and starts the task. Uh, and the f -sharp programming model is based on continuations. So essentially, it's a, it's a function that you can call with a continuation. It will start doing something and eventually call the continuation. Uh, the main difference is that you can use the same asynchronous workflow, run it multiple times. Uh, and I, I believe this, this programming model better matches the compositional functional style because just creating asynchronous workflow doesn't actually run any, any operations. So there are quite a few cases where uh, the other programming models would be a bit confusing for F sharp. But that's, that's essentially the difference uh, or the choices that you have when designing feature like this. And I'll hand over to Dom. So we're running through these four um, features in this part here today, thanks for everything we've done. And now we'll be talking about the stuff we need to measure, and then we'll go into um, what we think of as big data features. Uh, F sharp 2.0 and 3.0. Uh, and so here's the measure in F sharp. These are slides from Andrew Kennedy's talk, the talks on, on this, which are available online, and there's a, there's a great series of tutorial notes. I think here's the measure is just a, is a beautiful theory practice feature which uh, uh, Andrew's tutorial notes from uh, the summer school last year one, as I think attached to ECAPS or one of the, one of the major European conferences that he took um, was an uh, excellent set of uh, notes to start with just like very practical physics programming you know doing kilograms, meters, acceleration, things that students immediately are familiar with but then by the end you're talking about relational semantics for, for, uh, for, for, for units uh, and it really Beautiful end-to-end from practice to to, to to theory as a, a single topic, and the topic is just slightly off to the side uh, in the sense it's not like you don't get end up in language arguments that much about you know is, is one C sharp very better than F sharp or anything other things. You're just focusing on on, on this one one topic as you as, as, as you go through with, with, with students. Uh, okay, so the, on the practical side, there are these great examples of uh, some uh, NASA experiments, uh, it's no doubt military related, where they're firing uh, lasers up the space shuttle, and then the, the space shuttle did this instead, as it started to point itself towards the mountain, uh, and they all wondered why they were going upside down, and uh, it turns out that they thought the mountain was 10,000 nautical miles above sea level, and instead of 10,000 feet above sea level, so that was just programmed incorrectly, and they were going all the way through. Uh, to the, the whole space shuttle turning up the wrong way. There's also some more catastrophic versions of the same thing. Uh, this is a $125 million Mars orbiter that went wrong because of a mix-up between English units. Uh, 
Bobby Martin, he was an English international while the ACC has been used in that metric. Very key space for operation. And uh, it went very badly wrong. Okay, so the, the solution has been, so such an obvious solution is to check the units at development time uh, by static analysis or by type checking. Uh, and it has, there's, you know, this is not a new observation. There, uh, long history of a mixture of language ideas and uh, there's like C++ library for units of measure using various template trees and uh, uh, many, many papers from, from the here on using dimensions and units. So, I mean, there's, there's two sides to what Andrew's design in, in units of measure in a sharp. First of all, it's actually put into practice in a, in a way <coughs> that is really non-intrusive in the language. It, really just start to use units in a very natural way just when you need to. You can take the floating point numbers and just start to annotate them with your kilograms and meters and, uh, your <coughs> and, and so on. And a key thing is that, and I think why it's so interesting from the ML family of language perspective, is it fits beautifully with type inference, semi normal type inference. There are very few theories, algebraic theories, which, uh, which have uh, units uh, best solutions uh, in, in, in Henry Miller type inference. Uh, the units of measure is one of the theories that does have, uh, have unique uh, best solutions. And, um, and a lot of Andrew's papers are about describing why that type inference works in practice. And what this means is you can not only write concrete unitized code, where you're dealing with concrete uh, ground units of measure, kilograms and meters and so on, you can also write generic unitized code, and the type inference will just kick in and make the code automatically generic uh, once you once you indicate you want some unit inference to go on in a couple of places. And that is actually important in practice if people are writing. Uh, like a common mistake is in a basic statistical algorithm is to mix up um, variance and standard deviation, uh, sigma and sigma squared, and you can see that in the unit analysis, the generic unit analysis of a generic statistical algorithm. And we found the core mistakes in core statistical code in deployed Microsoft algorithms. Uh, I'll talk about the case study in a moment. Um, based just on better inference over, over, unit, uh, over, over code uh, if using unit measure. So the design here is, yeah, so minimally invasive with type inference in the spirit of ML and Haskell in the normal type inference. You start annotating literals with units and you sort of get inference to the rest. And you really didn't get that feeling where you take these programs, uh, say uh, one example I worked on simulation code, the standard gravitational simulation code. And it's just a, a sea of floating point numbers, right? And you got, uh, uh, and without using units of measure, you start to use various techniques to control the complexity of just like everything's a number. And then you start using units of measure, and suddenly you're distinguishing astronomical units from meters, and you're distinguishing uh, seconds in simulation time from seconds in real time. And suddenly, all the distinctions become clear, and it's a, and you're, you're really uh, working with numbers uh, in a completely different level of confidence in your code. Um, so, and it really is a matter, you just annotate some of your ground inputs, right? So your, 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 your constants for gravity or your, 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 um, I'll, I'll actually show the code you should just really talk about. Um, yeah, so this is the untyped code. But everything's just a floating point number. We have some arbitrary, no, some can be converted from real time to model time, but it's just a floating point number to a floating point number. And there's a lot of scope for mistake in, in this code. Here's our, here's our description of a planet here uh, in the simulation code. And you know, there's plenty of 
You know, let's say they are starts on the site here, you don't have to get the square or variable here, or how do you say box X is fine, right? So let's take a look at the unitized version of this. Um, Okay, sorry. Um, I can actually plan on running this demo, so let me. Um, Right, so it's a simple gravitational simulation. We have Earth, there's a little dot, there's the moon here, the, the planets are made larger so you can actually see them, and they bring us in. And, and Mercury, I mean, a, a 3D, fancy 3D version of this with proper texturing and the like, as I'm sure you can all imagine, it's looking like a. You know, and, uh, this is actually one of the demos you can run in the Triad South Side in Silver Light as well, by the way, with the units of measure uh, from uh, added. But now let's look at the code when we have units of measure. So first of all, we, we define our basic measures here that we're going to use, meters, seconds, kilograms, kilometers. And uh, now when we give units, the basic constants, well, we say that gravity is actually meters, the, 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 the gravitational constant, or this is the type of end up having meters cubed, and maybe kilograms per second squared. And uh, the conversion factors to, to convert between meters and astronomical to units just have the, the exact Unitized type that we would expect that uh, we think the number of meters per astronomical unit. The meters per kilometer is a thousand, of course, and we, uh, <coughs> we can convert the other, get a conversion constant for converting the other way, 1.0 meters per astronomical unit. Uh, we can start having units for string coordinates like pixels, so what scaling we want. Now we know with strong confidence what scaling that simulation on the right is using. 200 pixels, one astronomical unit. And we kind of know that by the propagation of this constant here through the code, that that is going to be typeset, and we're not making, very, very unlikely to be making mistakes about that conversion. So now when we have seconds per year, it becomes a float of seconds here, because when we multiply this out, uh, our world well, we didn't put all the years in the last three of this, so that's uh, sort of annotating a ground constant as well. And now when we have a function to convert from real time to model time, there's a difference between seconds in real time and seconds in, in model time. Yeah. Okay, so now when we have our code, the input variable here now is a floating point number in astronomical units. Okay, so now we know what that number was, and we, we're not going to make a mistake, a, a core mistake. Now when we uh, deal with uh, the um, uh, the, 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 the core code here, let's say we make a mistake and we get the squaring factor here. Then uh, we get an error saying straight away, it's in meters, meters plus the maximum unit of measure, meters squared. Okay, inference is saying all the way through, immediately giving us those, um, uh, the, the strong typing over the code. And then the rest of the code stays pretty much exactly the same. We get down to the Wikipedia constant here. I think it's taken back to Wikipedia, the mass of the sun, or the Mercury distance from, uh, from the sun. Uh, we start to multiply these up. So it's interesting, the data from the, 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 the data source, when I got it off Wikipedia, was in kilometers. So you can immediately just apply the conversion factor to get that in astronomical units. And uh, that's the, the inference of the gate to the I think there are no examples of generic inference in this code, uh, but uh, you can easily um, uh, work those generic codes to uh, generic units of as well. Okay, so I think that gives a feeling for units of uh, uh, units of measure. Is 
then a key thing is that there's no runtime cost, there's all arrays. Uh, that means the numbers remain numbers, there's no implicit allocation, and um, <coughs> which just means you know, so that you can have confidence about the performance characteristics of your floating point code. This is extensible, you can use it for all sorts of numeric types, uh, you can use it for, for, for vectors and, and, and matrices and so, so on. Technically, there's no support for dimensions, so the notion of, of mass, uh, for example, and there's no support for automatic conversions, uh, but you've seen how you define the explicit conversions to get from one to the other. There's actually, you can do automatic conversions in this kind of system, but the problem is there's a lot of choices about where the compiler <laughs> inserts the conversion, so the insert it at the leads or insert it at the sources, and since floating point numbers, isoflu floating point numbers are not perfectly scalable, then you don't really want to hide those kind of choices from the programmer. Uh, so <coughs> I, I think it's a wise practical decision not to put in automatic unit conversion um, in, in the design. Uh, so there's a little help for the computation of the there. And to say you can use this in lots of other domains, uh, people uh, use it in pretty much any numeric uh, analysis code. Uh, this is sort of a financial kind of example. Generally for finance, because the economies aren't scalable and there's a lot of exponentiation where you don't get the same, uh, you don't get a good, uh, necessarily good unitization, then you use it in abstract notions and combining your shares. You don't involve in the rate of the same, uh, rather than trying to pin things down to be like, uh, you, you can choose this sort of granularity and you have to be a little bit careful about not going, trying to uh, overuse the feature in practice. Oh, uh, Andrew, I saw this quote from Andrew, I, I didn't do that this quote, but Andrew, he got this one from Bill Gates about why he never understood why people do things get into target systems. Well, we've done that now, so, we, uh, yeah. <coughs> um, I was really interested in There's a whole, there's all these classes of refinement type systems, which might feel very similar when added to the language, and uh, they're very, and, but uh, you can't do that particular refinement. You can just have a general notion of a count. Uh, you can attach units to integer quantities as well, which don't mm -hmm. scale. They don't have to You can't, it's not a general refinement system for attaching predicates. That's much more in the territory of things like F7, which uh, is a research extension of F-sharp, done for much research, uh, is refinement type. And uh, Connor would probably just, 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 just <laughs> rattle off another, another five or ten of the pieces of finding that this is that. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 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 It's especially a thing that, uh, a, a, an area where languages like f are very heavy on inference and very good at being domain-focused languages uh, have a role to play. If you try and do unit to measure in g or, or, or Java, then the number of places is terrific. Right? So you, you need an inference-based language. Yeah. Uh, so, so, no, we erase all the units There are various ways you can choose alternative encoding or manual encoding to push, push in some of the information around. So that you can't do reflection over the... When you do reflection over the type of these things, you want all the units to disappear. So it is a static feature. It's the, uh, you could imagine, I mean, from a research perspective, I think uh, you can definitely imagine taking the, these virtual machine designs, take the mono representation of the common language runtime, for example, and push units of measure through the runtime type information that gets stored and put in the, you have to be careful to put in the algebra <coughs> that meters times seconds is the same as seconds times meters. 
right. So I'll, I'll make sure that the algorithm is known to the type of quality in the, in the implementation. And then you can do that. And I think, I actually think doing, in .NET Generics, we did this like end-to-end -end extension of language and runtime, uh, pushing the input type information all, all the way through. And it's very important, very good result. And I think we should be doing more of that in the research community. And uh, Mono is, I think, a great place to be doing those uh, experiments because they already have type information pushed all the way through for generics. So it's just a matter of just sort of extending that path. And I think it gets some students doing those kind of projects. There's been something just I found a bit depressing about the last 15 years since the JVM came along that we haven't had students going and really modifying the virtual machine layer uh, as much as we should have. Everyone's been trying to work and just these virtual machines are setting goals or something. But from a research perspective, we should be just modifying them more in ways like that. Oh, in the static IL, uh, F sharp stores an extra metadata blob uh, off to the side, as a, uh, and we're containing more type information, yeah, which it folds together with the IL. Yeah, so F sharp to F sharp code understands units of measure. When you look at it from C sharp, all the units will have disappeared and just some numbers. Yeah. Okay, any more questions on units? Okay, so let's take a look at on um, F sharp 2.0 sort of uh, mm -hmm. So in, in this section, I, I, w I want to just run through some case studies to give you a feeling for why in F sharp we're so interested in the, 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 the problems of, of data, uh, of programming with data. Partly it's because when we look at what F-Sharp is for, we talked about problem solving from the language level, but in terms of a business at Microsoft, we really see that F-Sharp has a niche role uh, in the area of data-rich analytical engines. Okay? We're not thinking of F-Sharp as being user interface programming language, we're just really focusing on this core data, processing data. And there's something about functional programming is so fantastic, but this isolationist uh, tendency of functional programming means most functional languages don't work in a data-rich environment. Uh, so when you have Haskell, it's relatively rare that you're bringing data in from the outside. And if it is, it's a little bit painful for it to get it to be strongly type data. To some extent, that's true in uh, Camel as well. And uh, uh, But F sharp, because it has the .NET libraries, it suddenly has this sea of, of strongly type data <coughs> into, into the language. And that lets, once you have this strongly type data, that really lets functional programming sort of fly when, uh, as, a, as a means of processing and transforming that data. And when we think about that, we don't just mean running, well, we mean, you might have these engines running on the client, on a Windows <coughs> uh, client machine, or on server-side programming in particular. But you can also imagine having uh, these running on the, the phone, uh, or in the, in, in the cloud, on Amazon, or Azure, or others, uh, or on the Xbox uh, as well. And we have examples of all of these. When we see there's a game called Path of Go, and Path of Go is all about uh, pattern, using pattern matching over large uh, machine, machine inferred uh, uh, data sets and using machine learning to, to, to decide the position of the next move in the Go game. And that's on the runs on the Xbox. That will also the AI engine will also be running on the, the phone. And lots of example of that stuff in using server and also be used uh, to run similar engines in, in, in the cloud. The same engine might end up running in all of these different places. So just that running through this, the purpose of these examples is, is um, just to say why we why this is the domain of use of F-sharp and why data is so important. And uh, so this is uh, the, the, a company called Eon PowerGen, uh, one of the biggest uh, energy providers in, in Europe. They, they run a, a, an engine to balance the national power generation schedule with an F-sharp engine. The rest of the application might be C-sharp. Um, uses units of measure everywhere, which is interesting. Uh, and, uh, 
when Simon wrote up this case study, he said that yeah, the really poor thing is the, the, the role of FCAP to address this complexity, the hardity of the application, of the algorithmic analysis of large data sets. And now, when you drew out why FCAP is important for that kind of problem, you have this interoperation. Units and measures, really interesting that units and measures, 95% of FCAP programmers never touch them. So that when they are needed, they are critical as in the simulation phase. Um, and then he went through this exploratory programming and code deduction. Very, very, very clear summary of why it's a, a why functional type functional programming is so effective in practice for this kind of this kind of today. Uh, so there's lots of examples of finance companies. It's again a very similar thing about enhanced rating engines, risk analysis engines, working out the data set doing efficient uh, algorithmic analysis of those data sets. Uh, biotech, there are good examples as well, uh, as well, just building DNA processing engines. Uh, and uh, the speed really does matter here. It's like 20 to 100 times faster than Python, which is what a lot of people use for this kind of work today. And the last case study I want to look at is this uh, use of F sharp for the machine learning algorithms uh, for Bing click prediction for ads. Uh, it's partly because the sheer scale of the data is, is, is enormous. Um, in this case, they're facing real-time updates, uh, thousands, and thousands of log entries per second as, as people choose whether to click on an ad or they enter search terms. Uh, <coughs> and uh, that, yeah, so every time someone's clicking on an ad, it's being displayed to the service, which is ultimately around 30% of search uh, of ad deliveries delivery for search in the United States. And there's a competition around at Microsoft to do machine learning over a six terabyte training uh, data set. The aim is that the, the teams had four weeks uh, of working with the data, and in this case they form machine learning experts and Microsoft research uh, in the team. And they end up writing an application, a probabilistic inference application, um, which and, uh, uh, is basically uh, a, a, a factor graph of um, Hundred uh, huge array, huge sets of arrays of 100 million probabilistic pairs of probabilistic variables representing the, the, the knowledge of, of various parts of like uh, what is someone maybe their IP address or what is uh, their what is the uh, what, what what search words were in the terms of the, of the queries that they've been entering, what were the characteristics of the ads that they had displayed that they chose to click on or not click on. And uh, in the end, that kind of information is totally critical for deciding what ads to actually display in, in these boxes and uh, it's very, very direct correspondence to revenue and pricing for the, the ads in Google and, and <coughs> Microsoft. So six terabytes of data, took them two weeks to see some time to train up their, their model and uh, they, they also wanted to do real time learning so you could adjust the whole, the whole instance algorithm um, in, in real time as, 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 as search changes over time, over, over the web. And uh, F-Sharp really was, the, the, they won the competition, the team at Cambridge. They also won it in an interesting way in that they had immediately deployable code. It wasn't an, a huge mess of <coughs> C-Sharp or C++ that some other teams had, but their F-Sharp code was extremely uh, ready, to, ready to go. For various reasons, it took the teams in, in America another 12 months before they actually deployed it. So it's organizational thing. Um, and all the, you know, I watched this team as they were doing it, and the type inference is just, just really important. They got to think in their domain. They could refactor their code and parameterize it in very nice ways. They could do scripting and explore the data sets. They, the, uh, they could scale to very, very large data sets, partly because of the floating point. Numeric work in F-sharp is uh, very memory faithful. Um, so when I say memory faithful is that uh, .NET has this facility called structs. So when you create arrays of structs, you're not, you know you're not getting any garbage collection, you're getting very concrete data structures, you do back of the envelope calculations about how much, how many of these variables you can fit in a, in a 16 gigabyte machine. And uh, that, that really is kind of critical that you can kind of trust your execution environment in uh, not to be allocating objects where um, especially the large data structures, uh, you can really, you can, you can trust what's happening there. 
and their succinctness was that they, as you know, they're really doing it from probabilistic programming, probabilistic engineering, and they got to really live in that domain rather than think about the, all the object oriented kind of stuff that I've been doing before. And they did use the symbolic programming and the dot integration a lot as well. Okay, so the thing there, you can see that F sharp is developing a sort of a niche specialty in the big data kind of area, yeah. This is an, uh, an extreme one. I'll put the sound on as well because it's got some funky music that goes with it. Uh, it goes a little bit too fast, so let me just start with uh, Looney Tunes kind of cartoon music. So you might hear it. This, um, I'll, I'll answer the question more formally. This is a fun way of answering the question. So here's, a, here's an F sharp program, a function test that returns a, a list and uh, two, uh, two numbers there uh, for the. So it just returns a tuple basically here. And this is. Uh, shows the translation of that to C-sharp and then running it through this FX top tool, which is a quality engineering tool, to, uh, it tells you to adjust your C-sharp code in, in various ways. So the program I kind of starts with this and um, shows it. Okay, so, right, this is sort of stuff you have to write in C-sharp. You're writing uh, tag points, <coughs> the, the result structure here. And then you have a test function, and you create the tag point, and you fill in the bits and pieces, you add, invariably add to the collection, and then you return, okay. Right, and then you start running it through the, the quality tool, okay, and it tells you things like, well, you've got a struct here, okay, there's rules about how you write struct in, in .NET, and you should be overriding the equals method, and you should be implementing equality, just in case anybody ever wants to do equality over this struct type, right. So the programmer, merrily, you know, they're sitting automatically, they get red squigglies or blue squigglies or something, you know, they, they start uh, coding the stuff up, it's a, it's, and you feel like you're getting work done, because, you know, Phil was telling you to actually do this work, and so it goes on. So they do that, and then they get this, right? so, and then their stuff starts to kind of explode down, and then they, uh, they get there and say, well, okay, bits and pieces have to be internal, it just have to be public or protected, and, uh, and then they continue on, say, okay, let's do all of that, yeah. And they probably, they probably go look up a book about how to implement a hash code operator and combine hash codes and then correct the casing. They don't like the lower case things here. And then uh, provide more meaningful names than X and Y for these names. So, you know, we want meaningful names. <laughs> and so uh, then check. I'll just look at that again. Okay. So I'll, play it. I'll play it all the way through then. So now that's extreme, right? That was 35 lines or something, and, and, and a programmer would probably choose, because they're getting something so simple to choose not to go down that path. I mean, they would choose to use virus returns or some other feature for encoding to return to the tuple. Uh, but um, you, you get the idea. The factor, in, in, in practice, the, 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 different, the, the factor of <coughs> different tends to be about a factor of two or three in terms of code size. And that, that, that doesn't necessarily translate to a two or three times improvement in readability, but well-written f -sharp code uh, will be just as readable as the, as the, the original, just considerably more, I think, more readable. Than, uh, more readable. But yeah, two, two or three, two, factor of two or three, things, you know, depending on the demand. Does that sound better? Yeah, I mean, in, in that domain, I, I think it would be often be more. Uh, um, yeah, two or three is 
the minimum for when you translate object or traffic across the or more encoded traffic So no one's done a formal study there. I think the formal study is, is quite feasible because of its uh, like for like nature. There's every, everything else is equal, just the language is different. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, we'll look at uh, a taste of what we're doing in S sharp 2.0 uh, speech data work. Now, I'm going to be going through this material in full in the session on Thursday. And, but in a sense, what we're doing here is, is very, very simple and very simple rationale. We experience the world as being information rich all the time. We, we experience that on Wikipedia and the web and all sorts of other places uh, uh, all, all the time. And modern applications are totally driven by these, by structured data sources. You think of every, almost every application, even internet connected, connected application on your <coughs> phone. There's no data on the phone. All the all the data is coming from some external cloud-based, web-based source of, of of data. And application, you know, there's a sense in which applications like Word are, are also information rich, but they use a very general notion of information. They use a spreadsheet or a document or something. But applications today are much more tied to particular information sources, and they're about matching up data sources uh, for 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 example, to use a, a term that's being used a lot today. Uh, so, but of course we know that our languages and libraries and frameworks are incredibly information sparse. You can't find a definition of a chemical element, the definition of a football player, the definition of a bridge in the .NET framework, right? Uh, nor in the c -sharp language specification. But those are the terms which people obviously need to work and, and program. And so we want to address this. First, it, it is actually a problem. It's a very big problem for the strongly typed languages because you're always working. 50%, I reckon when I go and visit customers who are using C Sharp and S Sharp in practice, 50% of their code is about mediating between external data sources and the strongly typed world that they want to be working in. And so sooner or later, people end up giving up on these strongly typed languages and moving to JavaScript or moving to Python or moving to other languages where they just don't have type to get in the way when they just kind of, uh, they never need to think about getting things into a strongly type form, so they throw the baby out with the bathwater and just start working in a, in a completely loosely typed way. So F sharp 3.0 is very much about addressing this problem at a core architectural level in the language, and we're doing that by adding a feature called type providers. Uh, so think about it if you, if you needed to come up with a strongly typed, if you, any of your favorite strongly typed languages and you needed to come up with a, a chemical element strongly typed, okay, how long would that take you to design that library and to populate that library with information and with documentation? Okay. It might be part of a chemistry application, maybe you're a contractor and you need to be an easy one, you're being actually paid to do this, this work. And so what I want to give you a taste of is um, the, the application of this F-sharp 3.0 type provider feature to getting language integration, strongly typed language integration of a web ontology in this case. So we, we're going to use a semantic web ontology called Freebase. Uh, and you can think of it as sort of strongly typed Wikipedia. A lot of the information is taken by doing, doing screen scraping of Wikipedia. So we're dealing with an information source that has thousands and thousands of curators busy editing and improving this data source. Okay. Uh, okay, so we, we so we have our web data. And um, by what what we, what we have here is not, we're not uh, have, we don't have a library for Freebase. We can't create a library for Freebase. There's too many types. There's like hundreds of thousands of types on this web ontology. And there are more and more of these ontologies, <coughs> so this is coming standard practice for information workers today. And uh, since we can't create a library, what we create instead is an adapter component called a type provider, which, at, which instead of giving a finite set of types or modules or, or, or functions, 
it gives you a computer space. It allows the, the compiler to talk to this pipe provider, and it, it, it is effectively talking to what is a logically a library, but it's actually a computer, an on-demand, it's like a lazily computed library, or a library that's computed based on some external data source. And the key thing is that we're changing the, the architecture of the f -sharp tools, of the, including the interactive development environment, including the f -sharp interactive, and including the command line compiler that you can use, to be able to accept these pipe providers and to allow you to plug f -sharp into some externalized, schematized data sources. So let's take a look at what that gives us. Okay. So as we now work with this ontology, we now have a direct live connection with, uh, with, this, with this ontology where we can use the element, the object, the type, defined in that ontology directly in a strongly typed way. We've done full language integration of the, the external data sources into a, a type functional programming language. So our job was to uh, find the chemical elements, strongly typed. So there are the chemical elements here. And all sorts of other chemical things as well. And we'll use this little show grid function here later. <coughs> and now um, how the internet connection changes. So while it's loading up, Super fast for me. I might have to move on to the next sentence. Um, there seems to be something particularly slow about this. This is the slowest internet extension I've ever had. Uh, in the world of it's a little, um, I'll trust it and we'll come up to the later and just move on. The, uh, one of the key things is we're, since we're doing strong type programming against this, uh, against the uh, chemical elements here, then we're getting completion. We have type inference here to tell us that this is a chemical element. And the properties and knowledge about the data structures of the, 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 the logical objects that we're working with from the ontology are available to us in, 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 a, in our strong typing, and that means they're available to the tooling here as well. It means we get strong uh, information here, such as the, uh, the, the health information drawn from, from the ontology. So, so we get the definition of boiling point drawn <coughs> here. So I'm going to try to do that. Okay, so that's drawn, <coughs> drawn the set of chemical elements from the from the web data source. And then we gradually populate those. Okay. Just to say these ontologies have many, uh, many, many, many interesting things in there. If you uh, if you're wondering if you're you're mentioned, uh, then it's just surprised if you have some of the people here mentioned, the computer scientists are mentioned there. If you go and edit the properties correctly on Wikipedia, then you'll eventually appear in the, the, these kind of databases. Uh, see if we can bring those up. So <laughs> let's take a look at how you can use this in, 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 in practice. So I've given the uh, example of like find all the asteroids that uh, that have the name of a Greek god. 
And what is, what is interesting is that these things which are in some ways thought of as search problems or query problems, you know, by the kind of people doing unstructured search or structured search, suddenly become programming problems to the, to the software, to the programming, the software engineer. So this took about five minutes to do. And you say, okay, we want to uh, find every asteroid that has the name of a Greek god. Well, the, uh, the asteroids are easy enough to find. So we have all the asteroids under here. Well, we have at least a, a subset that are, that are, that are <coughs> on this particular data source. <coughs> For each, we also have the, the gods, so we can start to navigate and browse what they are. So we look for their religions, and we have various aspects of different religions, are the ones we, we want here are the deities here. And then for each deity, well, we can start to investigate the, the properties that they have. So, for instance, the religions that worship the deity, we take those religions that worship, worship the de deity, look at the name of the religion here, with various uh, properties about religion. And uh, if it contains Greek, then we, we, then we get the name. And because of this one, it's an international actually won't run the sample. We just continue to trace through that. We make that distinct, make sure we don't get duplicates. And that's just displaying it on the, on, the, on the display. And we take the set of names, and we check how many uh, gods we have. And now we start working with the asteroids. And then in the end, we get down to our solution, which is the, uh, this is the incremental development of the solution. Now for each asteroid here, it's, a, it's a, an asteroid. And if the word, it turns out the asteroid names contain also a number. So we split that into words, like we were doing with the Twitter tweets at the start. And if there exists a word, uh, that intersects with the god set here, so if the god, the god set contains that word, then we yield that asteroid, and then we have our result. So straightforward sort of programming approach to doing a query over strongly cast, over web-based information. Okay, so... So just to say that the... The model we're doing is a type provider is a compiler add-on that provides computer space of types and methods. It's also a compiler or IDE extension. You can think of it as an adapter between data and services and .NET languages. Uh, it's just something you add to your project. Mm. Here. They're very small components. And they bring in, you can use them in for all sorts of purposes. You can take web data, cloud data, big table kind of data storage. You can take in SQL databases and enterprise data local data on your machine, there's lots of strongly typed data that's actually surprisingly hard to get access to, or web services, and you can build your own type providers to project in information. This is the sort of code we would have had to write today to get the strongly typed view of the chemical elements into the very preliminary one, which becomes a one line, uh, a one line um, call, one line in FSARP 3.0. So FSARP still contains no data, so there's an open architecture for writing this, uh, writing this <coughs> type provider. So I'm going to go through this in more detail on Thursday, but the aim is you know, the world is incredibly information rich, and we need our languages and environments to be information rich too, uh, too. And the aim is to allow FSARP to just like break, break through these boundaries between language and strongly typed, schematized data sources on the outside. Okay. So uh, that's all for the tutorial, and I hope to see you all on the course on Thursday. We're also looking forward to lots of people in the chat, so thanks for all the questions, and thanks for coming along, and thanks for coming to the